Good morning, friends. My name is Claire. I'm going to be reading today's text. Uh, we're going to start reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I'm thankful to be back with you today. Today, we are going to be celebrating uh, communion. It's an interesting thing we do as a church. You may wonder why churches do this at all. And so today, I hope to answer those questions for you as we begin. Um, this has been a really enjoyable season for me. At the beginning of the year, uh, we ask everyone to renew their membership in this church. And uh, when you become a member here, we ask you to write out your testimony. And so over the past few weeks, I've got to read a lot of testimonies of how men and women came to faith in Christ, what it looked like for them. Uh, this, this week, I was, I was reading a, a few different ones. Uh, there was a, a lady who, uh, she just came out and said, hey, I used to be a witch. And I used to pursue dark things and occult practices, and yet I have found new life and forgiveness in Christ Jesus, and that's a joy. Uh, I read this week about uh, a young man who uh, had gotten in some, some trouble and drugs and raids on his house and all that uh, before he came to this church not very long ago. He's currently in prison but sent in his membership form and wants us to know that he is indeed a member of this body. And he's in, in a prison leading Bible studies and prayer groups and witnessing and testifying to the goodness of Jesus Christ to a group of men there. Uh, I got to hear this week from a young man who, uh, man, some brokenness in the past, some difficult things. And even though he has forgiveness in Christ Jesus, he is continuing to pursue uh, reconciliation and restoration where uh, he's wronged other people and trying to set those things right. And y'all, that story is told with, with different details hundreds of times over in this body. If, if you're new here and you think of us as a bunch of like, you know, goody two-shoes, like people who are holy than you or what that, that is not true at all uh, if you if you don't know who this church is we are a group of people who have sinned in more ways than we can describe we've lied and cheated and stolen and been selfish and committed adultery and abused other people there are people here who have been addicted and walked through every sin you can think of and yet what we have found is freedom is healing, is forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And the reason that we celebrate communion, the reason that we do this is because Jesus Christ commanded that we would do this in remembrance of him and what he has ultimately done for us. Now, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 today. And just before where we pick up, Paul is going to be, he's admonishing the church at Corinth because they weren't receiving uh, communion in, in a proper way. Uh, the way it happened uh, back then, uh, they would celebrate a whole meal. The church at Corinth, if you would have gone there, communion day would have been potluck day, right? So all the people who had a lot, who had you know plenty of means, they would bring a large sum of food um, to what would have been a feast. And if you were very poor, you may have only been able to bring a meager sum but they would all come together in unity and they would share in this feast, remembering the work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. Except at Corinth, that's not what was happening. Rather than coming together in unity, seeing their brothers and sisters at equals, um, the people who had more, they were, they were showing up early and they were indulging and feasting on all the food. They were even getting drunk on the wine such that when the poor people who didn't have much at all to bring uh, came, they were humiliated. They didn't get to uh, share together in the feast. What we need to see about 
communion. It is, it is a symbol of our unity in Christ. That the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross, and the worldly distinctions that might separate us outside of this church do not exist here. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or you're, you're poor. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity or nationality is. It doesn't matter, you know, kind of where you stand uh, socially with people or what party you vote for. When we come here together and celebrate communion, we are declaring that we are unified uh, under the gospel of Jesus Christ as his people. That unifies us together. And so the Apostle Paul, he's having to instruct them in, in what is correct, what communion should ultimately be like. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, he says to them, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, uh, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Now, you, you may not know this, but communion was instituted um, just a, a few hours before Jesus was going to be betrayed by one of his closest associates. He was going to you know, ultimately end up uh, dying on the cross for the sins of the world. Um, and, but before that is all going to take place, uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 14 tells us that Jesus gathered up his disciples and he says to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So two things going on here. Um, Lord's Supper is now being instituted, although the disciples probably didn't know it yet at this point. Um, but Jesus had gathered his disciples together to celebrate the Passover one more time. So just to catch you up to speed on what the Passover is, um, if you go back to the Old Testament in Exodus you, Exodus, you find the people of God are enslaved under Pharaoh in Egypt. They were his slaves, his servant people, uh, and they were there in uh, Egypt under the rule of Pharaoh. And God comes to Moses and he says, Hey, Moses, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So Moses does as God had commanded. He goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, what, my free labor? Like, no chance. I'm not going to do it. And so God begins to send plague after plague after plague on the nation of Israel. Egypt to persuade Pharaoh that he does indeed need to submit to God and let his people go. And so if you read about the, the plague, there was, there was hail, there were frogs, there were all sorts of things that happened in the nation of Egypt. And still Pharaoh hardened his heart and rebelled against the Lord. He would not let the people go. So the final plague, after the continued rebellion and sin of Pharaoh against God's people, was that God declared that every firstborn son among all of Egypt would be killed. But there, there, in order to make a distinction between the Egyptians and God's people, God instituted what's known as the Passover. Um, basically, an angel of the Lord was going to visit Egypt. And for every home that would take a one-year-old male lamb, a pure spotless lamb, and slaughter that lamb, and spread its blood on the doorpost outside of their house. And they would take that lamb into their house, and they would roast it and consume all of it. What they didn't consume, they were to burn. Those people would be saved from the visitation of the angel, which was going to take the life of every firstborn. And so um, the Israelites, who were God's people, they obeyed God. They slaughtered the lamb. They spread the blood. They consumed the lamb on that day. And when all of Egypt woke up the next morning to find their firstborn uh, sons dead, there was weeping and there was mourning. It even visited Pharaoh's house. And the, the outcry was so great that Pharaoh said, get out, y'all go. I want you to, to leave. And, the, and God used this to deliver his people out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. And he led them out into the wilderness where he would ultimately bring them to the promised land. And God instituted this feast called the Passover uh, to remind them of the this great deliverance that God had done on their behalf where he delivered them from slavery in Egypt and led them toward the promised land. So Jesus, on the night when he was going to be betrayed, he gathers his disciples to him. I've eagerly desired to eat this meal with you one last time. And he took bread and he broke it and he passed it out to each of his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Now, they wouldn't have had the same understanding about what Jesus was talking about that you and I have. 
They probably didn't understand all that Jesus was saying. Um, but lest we forget or lest we miss out on all that was there, uh, I want to talk to you about what that means. This is my body, which is for you. Uh, if you've been in church for very long, if we're not careful, we can lose sight uh, of what it means, of what it meant that Jesus offered his body up for us. And so uh, I want to run through that with you. Um, Jesus was God who took on human flesh. And he felt uh, pain in the same way that you and I would, physical pain. Uh, but there was also, you know, emotional pain and distress, just like you, you and I felt. Um, just a few hours after eating this last feast with his disciples, Jesus would be betrayed by one of the 12 men who was sitting in the room with him on that night. He would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Shortly thereafter, every one of his disciples would abandon him. Peter, the one who swore that he would never deny Jesus, he would go to his grave before he denied Jesus three times, denied even knowing who he was. Jesus was, was brought into the house of the high priest. They sat him down there, they beat him, they mocked him. They would place a cloth over his head and they would take turns striking him in the face and saying, hey, you're, you're the son of God, you're a prophet, why don't you prophesy and tell us who just hit you? Person after person, blow after blow. Having been betrayed, and denied by his closest associates, he's now in the hands of the high priest who beat him and mock him. They spat in his face. They handed him over to the Roman governor, uh, who was Pilate, who found no misdeed in him, no reason that he should be punished. He found him to be innocent. And still the crowd of people for whom Jesus was ultimately going to the cross for their sins, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate handed them over to be flogged and ultimately to be crucified. So they would have taken Jesus and stripped him down. They would have likely tied his arms around a post to, to expose his body to the flogging that was to come. The, the Roman soldier who was to whip him on that day would have used the cat of nine tails, which would have been a whip with multiple leather strands that they would have embedded bits of bone and shards of glass into it, such that when the Roman soldier would, would hit him with the whip, it would wrap around his body, and when he would withdraw it, it would tear his flesh in strips off of him. Lash after lash, blow after blow, Jesus was beaten so badly that he was unrecognizable. 39 lashes he received, and when they were done, they took and twisted together a crown of thorns, and they drove it into his skull. They took the heavy, rough-hewn timber of the, the cross member of the cross, and they placed it on his back, which had been destroyed by the cat of nine tails. And they forced him to carry it to Golgotha, at least as far as he could make it before he collapsed under its weight. When he got to Golgotha, they stripped him naked, humiliated in front of his friends and his family, in front of strangers. They stretched out his arms on the cross. They drove nails through his wrists and through his ankles. And as they stood that cross up and it dropped into, pla into place, it must have been excruciating pain as his body now hung on nothing but nails. But that wasn't it. Every breath he took until the moment that he died he would have had to pull and push himself up on those nails which must his body must have been screaming in agony just in order to take in a breath only to drop back onto them again but that wasn't the only suffering that he endured there on the cross Jesus endured the wrath of God. Jesus endured God's just punishment for sin. The punishment that you and I deserved, Jesus received. He endured it. He cried out there as he hung on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God turned his back on his own son. Jesus felt the pain of separation from his father for the first time. The full wrath of God being poured out upon him. 
As he breathed his last, he cried out, It is finished. As Jesus gathered his disciples together, eagerly desiring to eat the Passover meal one last time, as he took the bread and he broke it and he distributed it to each of his disciples, he said to them, This is my body, which is for you. I don't think they could have possibly understood all that that meant. But here's what I want you to know. It wasn't just for those 12 disciples in the room. It was for you, and it was for me, and it was for every man and woman who would ever come to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Every man and woman, just like you and me, who would become convinced that their sin was indeed offensive before God, that they had rebelled against God, they sinned against Him, that they did indeed owe a debt that we could not pay. For every one of us who would come to understand that we were sinners and in need of a Savior and cry out to Jesus to save us, Jesus would say to you and He would say to me, This is my body, which is for you. What he endured, he did it for us. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We celebrate communion, or we take the bread and we take the cup. We do this to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. I don't know about you, but sometimes as I go throughout my day, about uh, go throughout my life, I get distracted by um, bills and ball games and trying to keep up with my kids and trying to have a good marriage and all the things that life has to offer. And sometimes I lose sight of the fact that Jesus Christ offered his body for mine. He endured the punishment that I deserve, that I might live and enjoy life with him rather than facing that sort of punishment. Do this in remembrance of me. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 7, was written hundreds of years before Jesus ever went to the cross. And here's what the prophet foretold would happen. Isaiah 53 says, He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we were healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus says, this is my body, which is for you. I don't know what your story is. I don't know the depth of your sin. I don't know where you've been, what you've done. But here's what I know. Jesus Christ offered his body on the cross. He endured the suffering and the pain and the wrath of God for you. That you might find new life in him. That you might find forgiveness there. That's why we celebrate communion. We remember the work of Jesus Christ for us. In verse 25. In the same way, also, he took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Luke chapter 22, Jesus describes the cup poured out as one that was poured out for, the, for many for the forgiveness of sins. Here's what Jesus was doing. You remember the Passover? You remember the lamb? that had to be slaughtered, and its blood spread on the doorpost, his body consumed. Jesus is saying, I'm a greater Passover lamb, and here's a much greater deliverance. 
It's not a year after year. If you know the Old Testament, if you've read much of the Old Testament, every year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, uh, the great high priest, the people would come and they would bring their sacrifices. And the great high priest would go into the Holy of Holies to represent the people before God. And there was ceremonial washings that would have to take place. And the, the, the high priest could only go in once a year and only with the blood of the Lamb. And there in the Holy of Holies, he would spread the blood on the mercy seat, on the horn of the altar to make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus is a greater Passover lamb. Jesus is a greater high priest. Jesus is a greater sacrifice. He did it all for us. He was fulfilling what the Old Testament had been teaching and prophesying. He was the great Passover lamb. That Whereas when a lamb was slain, a physical lamb was slain, year after year was never able to fully absolve us of guilt. Jesus Christ died once for all of our sins. That means the sins of the past and of the present and of the future. Jesus died to make atonement for them all. His blood was shed before the Father so that ours didn't have to be. There's no longer a sacrifice. We don't go to the temple. We don't offer you know, lambs to the high priest. But instead, we look back to Jesus, whose blood was poured out for us, for the forgiveness of many. It is the blood of a new covenant. Now, in the Old Testament, the old covenant was based upon the law. Am I keeping the law? Am I breaking the law? How am I doing? The new covenant is no longer based upon the law. Jesus Christ, he came and fulfilled the law perfectly. The new covenant isn't the blood of a lamb. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. So no longer do we say, how am I doing according to the law? Instead, we look to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you want to know where you stand with God, look to the righteousness of Jesus. Are you in Christ or are you still looking to your own works and how well you can do before God? The old covenant says, look to your works. How are you doing according to the law? The new covenant says, look to the perfect life of Jesus, trusting in his blood, his sacrifice that was offered for you. Jesus Christ is the center and the substance of communion. Today, our celebration and what we do is we are celebrating the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, what he endured for us. Remembering that we didn't deserve it and we couldn't have earned this from God, but he freely gave his life. Jesus willingly went to the cross for us. And so we remember the body that was offered up, the blood that was shed, the blood of a new covenant. We receive it with thanksgiving. Now, I want to give you a few quick instructions about communion and how we do things here. Um, Number one, communion, kind of like baptism, is for believers only. If you've not yet trusted Jesus Christ, entered into the salvation and forgiveness that is available only in Christ, uh, we're glad that you're here. Like We're delighted that you have joined us. We want you to be here. This portion of the service is only for those who are believers in Jesus Christ. Um, Number two, Um, If you don't belong to this church, but you are still a believer, we welcome you to receive communion with us. Uh, Communion is not a celebration or remembrance of this church or anything we could ever offer you. It is a celebration of the work of Jesus Christ and what he has done. And so if you are a believer in Christ, no matter your church home, we welcome you to celebrate with us. Today, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, I'm going to invite you to come up and receive the elements and then take them back to your seat and wait. Uh, We're going to all receive them together. And so right now, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to invite the deacons to come, and then we're going to receive the elements. Lord Jesus, we bow before you thankful. God, we bow before you humble. Or not a person in this room has a leg to stand on in terms of our own good works and deserving anything that you've done for us. And yet you are the God who saw us in the midst of our sin and yet freely gave your life for us. So Lord, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving and joy and gratitude, looking not to our works but to yours. Lord, we thank you for the body that was offered up, for the blood that was shed for us. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.